And I am excited to welcome to the stage Ali Soltani and Melissa Bressler, who are going to help us learn more about um, stairs and entryways and how we can make our homes safe and accessible. Uh, but we're going to be focusing on stairs and entryways today, but all things are open related to um, uh, safe and accessible homes and universal design, especially with Ali and Melissa. Um, so welcome the two of you. Uh, Ali, I know you're feeling a little under the weather today, so I'm glad you're joining us for, for the beginning. Um, uh, before we dive into this topic, let's get to know the two of you a little bit better. Um, Ali, since you're not feeling too well, I'll start with you and then you can dive behind the curtain there. Good morning, Steve and uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Ali Sultani. Uh, I am one of the project manager at Handy Pro. And uh, as uh, Steve uh, talked about, we do uh, home accessibility such as ramp, uh, stair lifts, so any kind of accessibility, small or big, from grab bars or renovating the entire home. Uh, we have the knowledge. I myself, I'm a civil engineer and I have um, um, certifications to understand people with disability. And uh, we we have other um, professions on our team, such as Melissa, that she's an occupational therapist, and she's been in occupational therapist uh, field for quite some time. And uh, uh, we were lucky that she joined our team, and uh, she oversees everything and design uh, homes and you know, you know equipments for our clients. And also, she's she's outreaching to our network. One of our goals is that. Steve help us to get to that goal is to educate the market, educate the uh, the people that they need this. We want them to not to be scared to ask for what what they need and what it is. So we don't charge anything for estimates. So you can just do a favor to yourself or to your clients. We can uh, give a very comprehensive report what they need and um, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, then we'll give you the cost and we also can give you a roadmap to see how we can do this. As, as Steve mentioned, um, I don't feel good today, so I'll pass and we have Melissa to continue the presentation so you don't have to hear my thick voice and my coughing all day. All day. Well, thanks, we Steve. Hope, yeah, we hope you get better, Ali, and, and thanks so much. And uh, Melissa, I'll, I'll, I'll move to you. Tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to your current uh, role. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Steve. And thanks, everyone, for taking the time to be here today. Uh, so my name is Melissa Bressler. I have over 10 years of experience working as an occupational therapist in uh, an outpatient center in Washington, D.C. I'm licensed in Maryland, Washington, D.C., and New York. Um, I've had the you know fortunate experience of being a, uh, a consumer of these accessibility products. Um, and as a part-time caretaker uh, for my disabled sister, um, as well as my aging parents, and um, also as a health professional. So I've kind of seen it from all different sides. I'm really happy to, happy to be working with our home modification team to enable individuals to maintain their independence and function in our homes. Um, you know, our main purpose is to improve a person's safety, accessibility, and independence. We want you to feel like your home is, you know, a comfortable place again. Um, Excellent. Now, before we dive into the discussion, um, Ali mentioned it, you're an occupational therapist. And I think um, most of us in the audience think of occupational therapists in this clinic-like setting, a rehab center that has maybe like a a car parked in the, the middle and a, a couple of stairs and a kitchen that doesn't look anything like the kitchen in our home. And the clients get in their car, come to this artificial setting and they practice their exercises. Um, I think that it's really a, a great trend at, to see occupational therapists in this setting helping clients with that rehab, but modifying our environments so that you can function better. Um, 
that must have, did you feel that this was kind of a, a, an interesting or what did your, what did your colleagues say when it's like, hey, I'm going to, uh, to do this? Did they, this is like, wow, you're outside of a center. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. And it's great to, you know, individuals would come in and we would do therapy in these simulated situations. But then we would always ask, oh, you know, how'd it go? Did you try this at home? What was different? Oh, bring in a video. Uh, but now it's nice to be, you know, in the home working in, um, in their own environment. Because um, there's, there's nothing that's, that's like that. And it's, it's great to work, uh, you know, with a team, uh, we all kind of bring uh, our own expertise and, you know, professional uh, opinions and advice to the table. And, uh, you know, two heads are always better than one. And it's, it's, it's really, it's really been rewarding to, to be a part of the, the whole modification team here. I you know, it. we want to find solutions, you know, what we do as OTs is, we find solutions to kind of everyday activities and, you know, challenges that people may have. And um, I'm really happy to be doing it uh, kind of on this platform, uh, you know, providing compassionate, collaborative care. I love it. Now, this topic today, we're going to be focusing on, on stairs and entryways. And I, I want to thank you, Ali, because I bumped into you a few months ago and you're like, hey, we got to start uh, we got to get back to going through the house. So I'll tell you where this all started. If you can see my screen, when you go on our website and you, you uh, click on on-demand recordings, you'll come up with this menu and you can type in safe and accessible. You can type in anything. But what you see here, we've done quite a few discussions on safe and accessible homes. But the first one we did here was at the villages of Kensington, where we actually went into a village member's home and we walked through the entire home. It was kind of overwhelming, but it was great to sort of see a real person's home and have folks giving, pro professionals giving feedback. And then um, one of my favorite discussions was with Rosemary Rossetti. She is um, actually Handy Pro sponsored this. Uh, she is this national expert who's created, she lives in it, a, de a universal de design demonstration project. Our, our last, so what we decided was, hey, let's really dive into the various piece, various components of the home, as opposed to looking at it from the big picture. And so our first discussion was on grab bars. And so now this is our, our follow-up to that, where hey, look, if you can't get in and out of your home, I mean, people can't visit you, it can be really challenging. So stairs and entryways are really a great next topic. So I'm going to shut up. I'm going to go behind the curtain. I'm going to pass the baton to Melissa. Um, folks, if you've got questions, type them in in the Q&A box. And then um, Melissa, if you want to take a pause, you know, from time to time and just check in with me, I'll let you know if uh, if if we've got any questions. Sure, sounds great, Steve. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Um, we're good as far as uh, the first looks slide. Good. Yep, looks okay. good. Wonderful. All right, so we're going to take an in-depth look at stairs and entryways, and you know. Are they considered accessible or is our home considered accessible at this point? Uh, and if, you know, we determine, you know, maybe we could do better, uh, we're going to kind of figure out and discuss together, you know, what are some things that we can make our, our stairs and our entryways safer? So this is just a little bit about myself, as I uh, explained before, so I'm just going to breeze by that. If anyone has any questions uh, later on, feel free about some of these certifications. Um, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit today about, you know, are our homes today considered safe and accessible? What is a home modification and how do they help us stay safe? 
we're going to look at, again, entryways and stairs. We're going to focus on that part of the home. And what do they have to do with falls? You know, how many falls are happening, you know, uh, that are involving stairs or entryways related to other types of falls that may happen in or out of the home. We're going to talk about how home modifications and accessibility equipment uh, can be present and help improve our safety in our home. And then how do we prevent falls from happening on stairways? Because we know it all happens. All right, so our homes today considered safe and accessible. So just looking at some of the literature, 52% uh, of homes have one floor and 42% of homes have a step-free entrance. That's not bad, you know, it's a little over 50%, but I think we could definitely do better. Um, if we take a look at as far as if somebody is using a wheelchair or some type of mobility device, Having an accessible home uh, goes down pretty heavily. So according to a study from 2011, 4% uh, of homes are considered accessible to a person that uses a wheelchair or somebody with a moderate physical challenge. And what do I mean by a moderate physical challenge is you may be using a walker or a cane um, to get around. Uh, it's been determined that about 70% of falls happen in the home itself compared to outside of the home. And as we get older, um, our physical mobility and our health changes. And so one in seven adults may have a physical challenge or a change in their mobility status and that increases as we get older and if we look to the american journal of emergency medicine each year one million people have injuries related to a fall that happened on a staircase or a stairway now it's even more surprising when i was looking through this is the cost of these, you know, whether it's an emergency room visit or whether it's a, a long extended stay uh, in a hospital uh, because of fall related injuries, it's over 90 billion per year. So one way to kind of, you know, make ourselves in general safe at home is through home modifications. Um, I know we, some of the other uh, discussions that uh, Steve, I know you've had uh, kind of give a general or a broad overview of, you know, how do we make our home safe or how do we prevent falls in our home in general, but we're gonna focus today on home modifications. So a home modification is a small or large change made to a home with the goal of improving accessibility, safety, and independence. And you'll kind of see that throughout uh, the presentation. Those three items are kind of your, you know, bread and butter, your crux of what a home modification is. Home modifications also increase visibility to a home. Visibility is kind of this term or this definition that makes your home kind of visible or someone's able to access your home, regardless of if they are walking through your front door, if they are wheeling through your front, front door, if they're rolling through your front door, whatever it may be, your home is able to be accessed by, by anybody, young and old. So they have these visit visitable criteria that usually refers to that at least one entryway doesn't have any steps, that you have at least a 32 inch doorway clearance, 
and that there is one bathroom on the main floor or the first floor. So you don't have to go up or down any steps to get to a bathroom. And so a lot of times with homes, uh, just small changes can make a very big difference. So if you take, if you see my friend T-Rex here, you know, he has a physical disposition of having short arms. It's something that he cannot control, okay? He takes some, he gets some reachers and, you know, he expands his reach, uh, you know, probably about, you know, three times the, the length or threefold. He's able to, you know, get what he needs, whether it's reaching into a cabinet, whether it's picking something up off the floor, because uh, as we know, as we sometimes get older, our balance changes and our bodies change. And, you know, sometimes just reaching out of our base of support, you know, reaching to the side or reaching up can throw us off balance. So I stand at four feet, nine inches tall. Um, I make small modifications every day that, you know, maybe I don't even think of, or that we don't really even think that we're doing it just become like common and a routine. Uh, so as far as like my entryway, I have to modify my, you know, people if I'm looking out, I uh, want to see, you know, who's knocking at the door. Or a lot of times on, we have our sliding door in our back and we have an extra security feature and it's always at the top. Um, so those are just some small changes or modifications that, you know, I've made, I've put one actually at the bottom. So I just have to step on it instead of having it on the sliding door up at the top. All right. So let's talk about how do stairways and entryways, what do they have to do with falls? So if you're thinking about, you know, about one in five, adults have a fall each year. Uh, if we look at staircase related injuries or falls, it's 1 million people each year. Some risk factors to think about as far as, you know, what's gonna increase your risk of falling on the stairs, it's gender, age, and physical disposition. So females are more likely to have an injury from a fall than males. Age, children under eight, the age of four years old and adults over the age of 65 are more likely to have a stair-related injury. And these injuries are widespread. They can be, you know, body injuries like to your legs, hips, ribs, or head injury. Uh, Breaks, fractures, sprains, and strains are the most common injuries for a stair-related injury among older adults. So now that we've kind of talked about what uh, what are some of the challenges that we face? You know, that these are these risk factors we cannot control when it comes to stair related uh, falls or injuries. You know, how can we make our, our stairways or entryways safe? So, making our entryways more visibil visit visitable, adequate lighting having lighting uh, as you're walking up to your front door, having an overhead light uh, right as you enter your front door, doorways, having them, you know, 32 to 36, you know, a 36 inch door. Um, the swing of the door should be entering into your home having a lever style doorknob versus the, that round kind of clunky doorknob is easier to manage, especially if our dexterity is limited or our grip strength is limited. Uh, widening our doorways, uh, if they do happen to be narrow, uh, utilizing an automatic door opener, 
using a keyless or remote entry, looking at a no-step entry, having a seamless threshold, making sure that our pathways are clear, minimizing thick carpet, and removing or securing uh, area rugs. So a lot of times I suggest those nice little area rugs, unless they're really secure on the floor, I would put them on the wall and use them as, as art. There are also special door hinges that provide an additional one to two inches of space. And that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be a huge, uh, you know, modification or project. So we could, our team could come in, you know, assess and see if, you know, your, el your door is eligible to have these, these special hinges, you know, put them in and, you know, you can be on your way. A lot of times, um, entryways or like side doors or even bathrooms have doorways that are narrow. So if you're using a walker and you have to go in sideways to get into somebody's home, I, we would not consider that the safest option. All right, so as far as stairs, how do we make those as safe as possible? Having a closed riser, so the, uh, the rectangular wooden uh, item in the, in the picture here on the right hand side, a lot of times you may see it's kind of trendy to have it open. Uh, it's safer to have it closed, so nothing slipping through, even for your pets, cats, dogs, if they're walking up the steps. Uh, making sure that you have non-slip rubber treads on the kind of platform or where you're actually putting your foot. That's what we, we would call a tread. Uh, if the stairs are outside, making sure that it's positioned where that water or snow when it's melting can kind of drain off. An optimal step has a width of about 36 inches and a rise of about seven inches. All right, so next I'm gonna go into a little bit about what are some accessibility items and modification projects that we've done in the past that can improve one's safety as far as steps and entryways. Uh, I guess I'll pause here if anyone has any questions before I move forward. Great, uh, this is good stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, well, I want to. I want to make note. I want to let everybody kind of see Louis Tenenbaum's comment in chat. Um, and Louis is a uh, um, a pioneer in this area of of universal design. And and I just want everybody in the back of their minds to think about these improvements that we're talking about today. But how can we get people to make these improvements before they need it? Because a lot of times it's when we want to make these improvements is when we're in the emergency room at the hospital and we know we got to go home to our house that's not accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so, th so that's one thing that I just want everybody to think about. And if you've got ideas, throw them into chat. But then let me, um, we got a couple of questions that have come in so far. Uh, Robert Pearson says, do you work with the Veterans Affairs Department and disabled veterans? The Veterans Health Administration offers HISA grants up to $6,800, and the Veterans Benefit Administration has SAH and SHA grants for structural alterations or construction up to $100,000 for eligible disabled veterans. Um, have, have Melissa, is, is your organization ever done any of the veterans things? I can, um, Steve, I can jump in. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that. Ollie, that's great. <clears throat> Sorry, Melissa. Yeah, we, we work uh, with all the uh, uh, grants that um, um, Veterans Affairs offers, and we actually, we are doing a project for uh, VA right now that, that it's uh, the, the total amount of the project is $120,000. Uh, so yeah, we work with all kind of uh, 
projects that we have. There are some of the um, specific grants that they have. They want to have the, uh, they just grant it to the companies that they are veteran owned, like actually disabled veteran owned. So those are, we cannot <laughs> participate, but the rest of the thing, yes, we can, we can do. Okay. Please reach out to us and we can discuss further. Great. And um, Robert, I dropped your question into comments so everybody can see those great benefits. Thank you for making us aware of this. And then Michael Ackerman has a couple of specific uh, questions on the steps. He asks the depth of each step. Um, if you could go, maybe go back to that slide with the um, measurements. And then um, the degree of a stair incline, is, is that a factor? Yeah, I know I walk on some of these steps in like uh, these post-war homes that are just, it's like, you know, you need to be a mountain climber. Yeah, and you'll be surprised uh, when we come out and do some measure measurements for some of our uh, accessibility uh, equipment. Uh, you know, you would think all steps are relatively the same in uh, in, in a staircase and surprisingly they are not. We actually measure a few steps and then take the average in order to, uh, you know, kind of make make up for that for that difference. And especially exactly you're right, Steve, with these with the homes that we have uh, in our community, you know, small and narrow is usually the, the way that it is and there's lots of pie shaped steps and and funky little kind of short steps and it definitely makes for for uh, a trip a trip hazard and it's definitely a challenge okay so there's there's not necessarily you're you're sort of when we're talking about steps it's working with the the canvas that has been created i guess the alternative where sort of specific measurements and degrees are going to be a real factor would be like a new construction where we're going to make this as optimal as possible. Right, right. Okay. We can also come in and, you know, um, remove all your current steps and, you know, just create a whole new uh, stairway or, or platform. Um, as you'll see in uh, one of the, the next slides, we, we had to do that to accommodate um, th this client's uh, staircase in okay. order to make it safe for them. Cool. But yeah, we can do, we can do both. We have to, um, Sometimes we can work with what's existing and do small modifications, and other times we need to kind of remove and create something new that's going to be optimal and, you know, safer. Okay, great. Well, those are the questions and comments for now. So uh, keep on going and, and feel free to check in with me later. Okay, great. And I just want to go back to, um, I guess, is it Robert's question on or Robert's comment on grants? So if you are a veteran and you don't own your home, let's say you're living uh, with a family member or it's a temporary housing situation, you're, there is also a grant through the VA that you may be eligible for if you actually need to modify where you're staying right now, that family member or that friend's home as well. All right, so keeping in, in mind what a home modification is, we're looking at safety, independence, and accessibility. So for this client here, they needed a curb stair lift in order for them to access their full bathroom and bedroom, which were both upstairs. Uh, while this staircase right here looks straight, uh, you can see that it has this one little curve here by the banister. So that essentially it would make it a, a curved st uh, stair lift. Uh, that, that, a, that a curved stair lift would need, would need to be installed on this staircase. Now, initially this platform here was not there. It was one of those kind of pie-shaped moon steps, which if we were going to have somebody go up the stairs on a stair lift and then get off on one of those half steps, that's, you know, completely unsafe. Now, the client did not have the ability to pay out of pocket for a curved stair lift. Curved stair lifts are 
double, if not more, the cost of a uh, of a straight stair lift. It's a custom rail that is made to the individual staircase. And also it takes a longer period of time. So if you're, you know, if it's kind of crunch time and you may be coming home from the hospital in, you know, two, three days, a curb stair lift, uh, you know, is not going to be a, a feasible option uh, at this time. So what we did create is, you know, we put our our thinking caps on together as a team. We came up with creating this platform, which is flush with the hallway area. And so then we were able to put in a straight stair lift, which saved the individual about $8,000. And we added this grab bar here. So that when they're able to exit or get off the chair or enter the chair from upstairs, they can use this grab bar for support and use it as they get into the hallway area. So while we're on the topic of stair lifts, stair lifts are an accessibility device that help a person travel up and down a set of stairs. Uh, you're in a seated position. And many of us think the use of a stair lift is for, you know, our older adults. They can be used by children as well. Stair lifts are fitted with a seatbelt. Uh, similar to a seatbelt uh, that you have in the back seat of a car uh, in the middle. Uh, it doesn't have an over the shoulder strap, but it has a strap around your waist. There is an option to put a harness as well if you don't have the um, upper body strength or support. Stairs can be installed indoors or outdoors and in a number of different types of stairways. So, if you see here in the picture, this stair lift is installed on carpet. It can be installed on carpet, on wood. Uh, if we're outside, it can be installed into, uh, you know, concrete or pavers. It can stair lifts can be installed on straight stairways as well as curved stairways. And it doesn't just have to be one curb, as you'll see as we go on. You can have multiple twists and turns uh, in a staircase. Now, typically when we're doing our measurements, when we're evaluating a staircase and we're uh, doing some measurements, we typically recommend uh, putting in a stair lift if a staircase is, at, is 40 or 24 inches or wider. Um, just a caveat to that, we also wanna take into consideration the height of the person that's using the stair lift, because that's also gonna impact uh, how much space we have. A lot of times we'll measure from your hip to uh, the back of your knee to see how much space uh, we're, we're going to have. Uh, again, talking about kind of just, you know, working as a team and making sure that, you know, these products that we're putting into someone's home is keeping them functional and keeping them independent. You know, we may ask how they're transferring into the seat. Uh, we may ask, you know, for example, in that last uh, slide, you know, the individual that was using that stair lift was able to, you know, step off the stair lift independently and use and use that handrail. Sometimes that may not be an option. So sometimes taking into consideration the landing area, you know, what's going on at the top of the staircase versus and the bottom of the staircase, you know, do we need to accommodate room for somebody that is assisting the individual getting off and on the steps? Or if somebody has a walker, they may have a walker, you know, one upstairs and one downstairs. So making sure there's enough room uh, at the bottom and top of the staircase in order for that person to safely enter and exit the, the chairlift or stairlift. So your indoor straight stairlifts, um, like we've said before, are installed on straight staircases where there's no twist and turns. If you're somebody that lives in a um, split level home 
as you see here in our picture, we can, you know, have two stair lifts accessing all floors. Uh, yes, you do have to transfer um, from one lift to the other, but it's uh, maybe a less expensive option than a curved stair lift if you're able to uh, make that transfer relatively easily. With these straight staircases, if you see here, we have something called a flip up rail. You can have a manual or powered flip up rail. They're frequently added to prevent uh, a trip hazard. So these rails have to stick out to accommodate when someone's getting on and off the, the stairs. They stick out about 16 inches. And then as far as the, the amount of space the rail is taking up on your staircase, it's about three inches from the wall. And that is for straight stair lifts, whether it's indoors or outdoors. These are just some common uh, kind of standards. Stair lifts are able to be installed on most straight staircases. So this actually makes for a popular donated item. We have a donation program where if someone donates their stair lift to us, we will pass it on to the next home without the, that next home paying for the cost of the lift itself. Um, it would just be a payment for uh, you know, our labor and, and workmanship. And so these straight stair lifts are easily able to be donated and kind of passed on because they fit most staircases. So here's a video of a of the and I'll play it again. So this is just a video of an indoor straight stair lift with a flip up rail. This is the powered flip up rail. I'll do it one more time just for good measure. So the, this flip up rail, we do recommend most of the time, uh, especially if the bottom of your staircase or even uh, has a, a doorway or kind of an, an area that maybe has some heavy traffic. Um, so we usually almost exclusively recommend having this flip up rail. It is an additional feature. So that means it is an additional cost. Uh, if a person does not want to have this flip up rail. Um, a lot of times we'll recommend putting some type of a large stationary item like a plant, um, some type of armchair. Uh, I think we've had someone use a totem pole or a, a tiki, tiki totem pole before, um, some type of decorative element. Because as you see here, this, in order for the chair to come down uh, and for someone to get on and off the chair, this rail needs to, this rail is extended beyond the staircase, roughly about 16 inches. And if you're trying to get to this room or you have a door there, you don't want to always have that blocked. So now we have our indoor curved stair lifts. Uh, for these, we take a we use a special 3D camera with special software to create a custom rail with multiple turns. And if the power goes out for any of these stair lifts, you have approximately eight rounds, um, eight round trips uh, where the stair lift will still be able to, to move even if there's no power. These are just some more curved stairs. I'm gonna skip ahead because I know we're, we're running short on time here. Um, again, stairlets are able to be installed outdoors as well. Uh, just something to keep in mind when we're looking at stairlets. Uh, we do need a power outlet about 10 to 20 uh, feet away in order for the 
uh, lift the rail and the battery to continuously charge. So you've got to have a, a double kind of power supply. The rail itself is being charged as well as the battery. And the max capacity uh, for a stair lift is about 400 pounds. So there are different models depending on what weight um, the individual uh, who's using the stick, the chair lift needs. And that's another question that we will ask when we're doing our consultation. So another item that makes our entryways more accessible are ramps. So wheelchair ramps come in kind of all different forms. I'm gonna skip a little bit ahead just so we, uh, we have aluminum ramps, we have wood ramps, we have threshold ramps that uh, are made for small thresholds and steps, usually about under two inches. And then we have landscape ramps that kind of blend in with our uh, kind of front uh, facade. Some of these ramps are kind of, uh, some of these ramps are more kind of a portable or accessible option. And some of them are a little bit considered more of a permanent structure and feature. If a ramp is not an option, then a vertical platform lift a lot of times is the right option. Uh, vertical platform lifts or VPLs are also known as porch lifts. They travel about one level or about 10 to 14 feet in height. Usually they take up less room than a ramp. So with a ramp, you have to have a certain amount of slope in order for it to be safe, whether you're walking up it or wheeling up it or rolling up it. And sometimes there's just not enough space to put a ramp that is safe. And so I know we mentioned before that there are, you know, the option of an outdoor stair lift. Sometimes that's not an option if an individual is not able to transfer into the stair or they need their wheelchair or their scooter to move around their home. So this vertical platform lift enables the individual to you know, roll up onto the lift, go up and access and enter into the, you know, onto the plat onto the porch area and then into the home. And the vertical platform lift can be, you know, a back door, a front door, a side door. It really all depends on um, space and accessibility options, you know, the potentially the preference of the of the of the household or the, or the homeowner. Uh, you typically see vertical platform lifts installed outdoors, but they can be also be installed in garages and indoors as well. So almost like an open air elevator in a sense. Uh, a lot of times with a vertical platform lift, we need a solid foundation. So we create this concrete pad. Our team does that um, ourselves. We don't have a like a, a another company that we work with that does that. We kind of do that all in house. So, uh, you know, if a vertical platform lift is something that you know you may be looking into, or is something you may you know need in the future to have your entryway accessible. Um, our team provides the concrete pad as well as the installation of the platform with kind of all in one. And uh, as far as installation goes, as far as a timeline, usually concrete takes about one day and then uh, the installation of the platform lift itself is another, is another day. Now we can't talk about stairs and entryways without talking about the presence of a handrail. A handrail is something that you grab onto when you're going up or down the steps. Um, we probably, you know, usually see it in, you know, 
most commercial commercial areas. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times we we don't see it in many homes, or maybe that they're maybe they're loose. I know uh, for my my parents' home, I've been asking them to get a handrail that leads down to their basement. You know, their basement stairs for you know probably over fifteen years at this point. <laughs> um, so I went through and did a little bit of research. I looked at twenty senior home safety checklists uh, to see which ones mentioned handrails and kind of what they said about handrails. So 16 out of the 20 checklists that I looked at mentioned handrails as a safety feature that should be, you know, on your staircase. And nine out of 10 checklists mentioned that a handrail should be on both sides of your staircase. That like That's kind of like the best practice or golden rule um, is handrails on both sides. And just this, I thought this was kind of an interesting fact uh, from a study from a study that was done in 2000, it found that 91% of young adults and 57% of older adults kind of recognized that they, you know, weren't using a handrail, uh, maybe were wearing improper shoes when they were, you know, negotiating, you know, walking up and down uh, their set of staircases. And this just kind of hits home that again, falls happen at any age, uh, any mobility status, you know, any any time. So we do want to take that into consideration, you know, prevention. What can we do now to prevent having a fall later on? Uh, handrails can be wall mounted. They can also be um, secured into the ground as well. So there are iron rails, there are wooden rails, there's a combination of iron and wood. It mostly depends on the uh, individual's preference. And then I'm gonna stop here and just to kind of cap it off and you know, in honor of Halloween coming off, I thought we would do a little uh, spooky home Mad Libs. Uh, so, I don't know if Steve, you want to help me out with this. Um, so I'm going to. Okay, let's see. What second. do we have here? Okay. Right. Mo home Mad Libs. Let me, let me get chat open. I, I, I appreciate this. I always appreciate anything that gets us networking here. Okay. So folks uh, use chat and uh, there is a house in my. All right, we're going to do a noun. So a person, place, or a thing. You're looking for a noun. <laughs> okay. Does anybody want to throw a noun in there? I don't know how... Per I... It's neighborhood. A okay, neighborhood. there's a house in All my right. neighborhood. So there's a house in my neighborhood. That is... We're going to look for an adverb here, which is something like uh, quickly or extremely or last week. All right. That's in your English skills here, English grammar, right? Haunting, hauntingly. Hauntingly, great. All right, so there is a house in my neighborhood that is hauntingly haunted. It's the old, we're looking for a proper noun or last name. Bates. Bates, okay. So there is a house in my neighborhood that is hauntingly haunted. It's the old Bates place that's been... We're looking for an adjective. So it describes a noun. Empty, derelict, either <laughs> one. All right. All right. There is a house in my neighborhood that is haunting, hauntingly haunted. It's the old Bates place that's been. Uh, either uh, yeah. derelict, decrepit, yeah. and empty. Decre okay. Decrepit for. How many years? Yeah, a number of years. Here, I'll give you 10, uh, 150 years. Okay. 150 years. All right. I can tell the house is, we're looking for another adjective. 
inaccessible. A good, inaccessible. good one, David. Yeah. Okay. Because there are, we're looking for a noun or a num and a number. Okay, let's see if everybody was listening here. Yeah. Why is the house inaccessible? <laughs> 20 steps, <laughs> dead bodies. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Okay, great. Uh, great way to kind of rally us there, Melissa. But let's yeah, get to these uh, questions. Sure. No sure. handrails. All right, they were listening to us. Okay, let's get to these questions here. Um, let's see. First, uh, Barbara says, I have wood stairs, but uh, wood stairs, but floor at the bottom of the stair has stone tile. Does stone tile present a problem on the floor? Um, so I would say no, uh, as far as installation of a, of a stair lift or just in general. Well, I think just uh, probably just in, yeah, in I mean, probably she's asking about the stair lifts because I think that's when she asked the question. But I also okay. sort of think that tile, you know, obviously, um, like wood floors, present less of a tripping and falling hazard. Yeah. But depending on your grout line right. and, and the texture of that tile uh, could make a big difference. Yeah, so it's... It Yes, agreed. Um, okay, let me go to chat because there's some great things going on here. Because also if you have, you know, those, you know, you let's say you have a small area that's tile and then you have a transition to maybe some type of other flooring that could cause uh, some safety concerns. Great, okay, so let's see. Uh, Louis Tenenbaum uh, was uh, sharing the incline is determined by the ratio of the tread and the rise, okay? Um, I, Elaine says, are carpeted steps good or bad? What are your thoughts on that? So I would say as long as the carpet is thin. Um, low, low pile. Low pile carpet. Yeah. Uh, I think sometimes it's a kind of aesthetic. Some people prefer carpet. Uh, I would say as long as it's low pile and you're wearing proper footwear, then, I mean, unless anyone else wants to bring in on this, I would say it's okay. I wouldn't call it a safety hazard as long as that that pile is, is low. Um, and I'll tell you, you don't need to be like, I, I mean, some of my worst falls were as a teenager ru running through my house in the socks and you know, sliding yep. all the way down the stairs. Uh, and I didn't expect to, that to happen. So it's probably, you know, like, like Melissa said, you know, if you've got to have carpet and you're mm -hmm. remodeling your home, it should be low pile, you know, sort of traction focused. But optimally, I think that uh, wood uh, with some, form of uh Rubber, texture and grip yeah. mm -hmm. and, and you know the other thing on uh stairways i know we can't touch on everything but also alternating the color um so that visually it you can see the end of the stairs uh each step um <laughs> going back to my upbringing and the white carpet and the white steps you you know you couldn't see the the next step and that's why i would fall all the time yeah, a lot of times now it almost seems to be somewhat trendy to have some de decorative um, edge or kind of decorative tape or design uh, on the nose or the front of each step uh, to give you that visual uh, difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Marianne Anderson said, can you explain the no sing? It, I guess it, it, in one of your slides, did it say no sing? Um, um, and while you're doing, while you're searching the slide deck there, um, I, I think I remember Maryland has a program to assist with such improvements. Um, yeah. What, what is the name of the program in Maryland? It's like, um, a able something, um, we need to look into that. Okay. Um. Are you talking about uh, the 
the organizations that come out and do the home assessments or? Well, just discounted programs. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, it's called Rebuilding Together. Rebuilding Together. Okay. That's mm -hmm. a Maryland program there. And then in, in Montgomery County and Prince George's County, it's um, Independence Now. Okay, I'm gonna, okay, rebuilding together. Yeah, so rebuilding together is, um, an, uh, I would say almost like a national nonprofit. I believe they're in 43 different states. Okay. And there are, rebuilding together has a branch in Baltimore, Montgomery County. And then if we're just talking about the DMV area in general, there is a DC slash Alexandria. Brand. Okay, uh, let's see. Marianne is saying, my question is on the slide with the diagram of the stair measurements. Okay. Okay. And it said no sing. Maybe I'm... Oh, uh, I think it's just the, the nose. Oh, oh, no. yeah, sorry. No. Um, okay. Yeah, it's that's nose. A, oh, geez. Nose. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the nose, the, 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 the lip on the stair. Yeah, the lip. The yeah, lip. it's the, they, it's the term is nose. Um, okay. So that's a lot of times where we may place a decorative or a brightly colored piece of tape. A lot of times as a as an OT, we use a lot of colored duct tape. Um, just to give that very heavy contrast. Um, and it's something that's, you know, inexpensive. But I know I've seen in looking at, you know, kind of home modification websites, you know, Pinterest, that type of thing. Now it's kind of like a, again, a very trendy, trendy thing to do. Even putting a kind of contrast or decorative piece on the riser portion. Well, thank goodness. I mean, you know, if we, that's one of the things we, to go back to Lewis's uh, uh, question for all of us is how can we get people to do this stuff? Yeah. It's make it trendy. I mean, we got to <laughs> make this stuff trendy. And, and the fact that alternate color stairs is trendy, that's the best thing we can do. Now we've got to make grab bars and no barrier entries and all mm -hmm. this stuff uh trendy too yeah um, let's see okay in chat uh lewis shares the ideal ratio um marianne anderson what is the current average price of a straight stair lift and how much for installation um i don't know like i i think marianne on that one i i know that it it all depends. It really does, right, Melissa? Yes. Because will, it, it it definitely depends. Uh, so I'll give you a general um, price. If we're talking a straight stair lift, no additional features, you know, just kind of your basic model. Um, right now, for a brand new one, anywhere from like thirty two to thirty seven hundred. Um, Again, there are ways to decrease that price um, with some funding options with, um, again, uh, potentially a donated or a used model. And it, that also depends on the, the brand as well. Okay. We do work with an, a few different um, brands or manufacturers. So that also impacts on the cost as well. Okay, cool. Um, Lewis comments, a ceiling lift could help with transfer from one stair glide to another. Elaine yes. says, can the flip up rail be flipped down while the person is sitting in the chair while coming down? Um, I think that was referring to your video that flip up rail. Yes. So, um, so with the manual flip up rail, uh, another individual would need to flip the, like, like take your hand and flip it down in order for that person that's using the lift to set. To come okay. down the steps. So, if you, um, but with a powered flip up rail, that can be accessed from, you know, the top course. of the staircase or bottom of the staircase. Okay. But that's, an, again, another consideration when you're trying to figure out are you going with a manual flip up rail or a powered flip up rail? You know, you're going to need kind of an, an extra body or another set of hands, in, or, unless you're going to leave it down in order to, you know, uh, to to get that that chair from the top of the stairs to the bottom of the stairs. Got it. 
Um, let's see, R. McKeever asks, can you show the screen with the landscape ramp again? Sure. And then Lewis says, especially landscapes ramps can be called no step entries. They often disappear in the landscape. And, and yeah, I mean, look how beautiful that landscape ramp is. Um, and it makes you realize that for, you know, some, uh, some of our neighborhoods, the terrain requires that there be some steps to get into a house. Mm -hmm. But in, in most neighborhoods that you drive through with a flat uh, front yard, it's like, there is no reason for there to be steps to get in and out of that house. It was just, you know, what the builders did. And um, I like how uh, Lewis refers to it disappears into the landscape. Yeah. Um, Tom says, I'm surprised that the handrails aren't part of building. Oh, yeah. Tom says, I'm surprised handrails aren't part of building codes. I, I guess in some cases, our handrails, they are part of a building code or are they, Melissa? Um, so I know for commercial use, uh, there are uh, a number of different code, codes for handrails. Um, I'd have to double check on as far as a builder, if somebody's building a home, um, if there's any, I mean, I know there's guidelines on how to, you know, placement of, of a handrail. Um, but I, I'm not sure if you're, you know, building a home, if uh, there's actual codes uh, related to 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 handrails, or if if even handrails, you know, need to be need to be there. Great. Um, again, another cost with another question about cost. Becky says, "What is the average cost?" Oh, and I we're we're what it's it's one oh five now. I'm just going to keep on going. This is recorded. Okay. We'll get through these questions, folks. If you it's we can jump on to it. Um, you can you can jump on the recording this afternoon. What is the average cost of a concrete pad with a VPL? What, what what's a VPL? So a VPL is a vertical platform lift. Okay. That's oh. The, okay. Uh, right. And uh, looking for an accessibility solution for a thirty-inch horizontal porch in Frederick County, Virginia, and I keep running into barriers with a ramp. Mm. Um, okay. Um, Becky, if you don't mind putting your contact info in the chat. Um, or, I can... or, or, or Melissa, if you drop yeah. yours in. Oh, drop mine in, okay. Yeah, then Becky, I don't want uh, everybody on the call reaching out to Becky unless Sorry. she wants us uh, all reaching out to her. But, uh, but yeah, to, okay. to um, put your contact in there, Melissa and Becky, yeah, if you reach reach out to her, um you said it was a 30 30, 30 inch porch in frederick county virginia okay um okay now we're getting through the mad libs uh lewis says i used to find that 30 oh lewis is responding this i used to find that 30 inches is about the cutoff from the difficulty and cost of a ramp to use vpl instead okay a vertical platform lift. Mm -hmm. okay um Okay, uh, and okay, um, I think I'm getting through the, I, okay, uh, Rebecca Grayson says, I, I thought there was a program for reimbursement in Maryland, and I think that Sharon may have shared this. Um, yeah, oh, it's a, um, Home modifications in Maryland. Oh, thank you, Sharon, for sharing the um, that link. I'll I'll repost it uh, for everyone there um, who is in Maryland. Um, and Lewis is another Maryland funding program. Um, Eileen wanted to know the cost. Can you give us a cost range for indoor curbs staircases? That. Uh... That's variable again. Very customized. Um, yeah, so it okay. really depends on like the length of the track, um, how many curves. Um, um, yeah. it, it's okay. I, <laughs> I think I I think 
those curves require customization and yes. and it, you really got to just get a proper estimate. Uh, R. McKeever says for handrails, two steps or more should be required. I, I totally agree. I yeah. mean, and, and, and it does, none of this has anything to do with being disabled. It's like going upstairs when you're holding something, having something that can can make it safer and easier is is super important. Um, and then yeah, I would I would say for a curved stair lift, I mean, you're probably talking like four thousand. Okay. All right. Plus. Um, All right. And then it looks like we got through everything. I'll I'll finish with uh, another words of wisdom from Lewis, who says steps to a home are default. Two reasons, keeping the wood structure from the earth so there's reduced transfer of insects and earth to the wood, the height of the main floor and plumbing above the sewer line in the street. Yeah, um, uh, so the, and um, let's see, it says, Eileen says, doesn't the curved stairs hamper the other person in the house from holding on to both railings or, or all of these stair glides will hamper somebody from having two railings to hold on to. So right? that's that's a really good comment. So a lot of times what we will do is we will either from yes, yeah, so sometimes it's not you're not able to have two handrails on the staircase when a stair lift is installed, but there are times where we're able to transfer the handrail to the other side or we're able to shift the handrail up uh, a few inches or again, what's accommodating or you know customer specific to the individual's height and how they get up the stairs and reposition the rail, the handrail that is still on the side of the installed stair lift. Right. And, and a lot of times the seat itself, if you're not using the stair lift is usually down at the bottom, you can you can have it down at the bottom of the steps, or you can have it at the top of the steps and always call it back with your remote. Um, so you can actually, you know, pretty much almost all of the way get get up the steps without too much, uh, you know, in, impediment of of the handrails, even if it's on the side of the stair lift. Got it. Okay, well, well, um, it, it doesn't surprise me. I think every one of these safe and accessible home discussions we have goes over an hour. Um, thank you, Melissa, but thank you to our audience. I mean, these questions are just fantastic. And this is what I love. I mean, is the, is the engaging discussion and getting to the, the topics and, and questions that you all are interested in. So. Um, uh, thanks a lot, and um, uh, I'm glad you you dropped your your info in there, um, Melissa. If you if you can, because I know somebody's going to ask if if you can PDF your PowerPoint and send it to me. I'll put that on the same page as the uh, the recording of this. And uh, so everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, again, thanks for your participation. And thanks, Melissa and Ali. If you're still out there, I hope you get better. <laughs> all right. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much. Thanks, Thank Melissa. You. Talk to you all soon. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.